So now we're going to move to our uh, next speaker. Yeah, superstar session. Awesome. Um, so now we're going to have uh, Yo Ayers uh, from Massive. Uh, Massive, which is a studio uh, that is in Malmo, uh, has been doing multiple games through the years. You've probably saw The Division, and now they're working on a new game. Um, so the, the session is the indie approach to AAA development. Uh, so welcome on stage, everyone. Thank you. Hey. All right. Uh, Here's the clicker. Yeah, it's work. working now. Working <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the indie approach to AAA development and why I think it's um, such an important topic. So first, a little bit about me. My name is João. I come from originally from Lisbon, Portugal. I've been working in game dev since 2017. Uh, I worked on mobile, VR, currently working on PC and console. Uh, and I work in organizations with less than 10 people, as well as organizations with thousands. On my spare time, I do a lot of uh, personal projects, organize game jams, community and commercial events. And I'm currently working at uh, Massive in Malmo, Sweden. So I want to do an exercise with all of you. And let's say we are around like 60, 70 people. Let's say that we are all in the studio, AAA studio, me included. And our studio has a new project. It's a kart racing game. And the brief is quite simple. It's an arcade racing game with a cartoony style, a roster of characters with different stats, and these characters can pick up and use power-ups, either to boost their stats temporarily or to attack opponents. We even have a code name for our project. And so we're going to keep things simple and we're going to say that in our studio there are only four main roles. And these roles are producer, designer, programmer and artist. And of course I'm leaving out a lot of them and inside each of these roles we have even more like branching specializations but we're not going to go into that for the context of this talk. And so each one of us, like we are put into different teams and each team has their own goals and there's their own focus areas. So some of you are going to work on three seasons, some of you are going to work on AI or you're going to work on, um, on uh, UI or, you know, like sky is the limit. Um, and so from all of us, like let's pick um, four people uh, from, from the studio from different teams and each one for each of the roles. So these are the four people that we picked. We have a producer, a designer, a programmer and an artist from different teams, same project, our kart racing game. Let's see for uh, each one of them what they have to do um, for the, um, this first playable build that we need to have like in the first six, six months. So, our uh, producer is a producer for the power-up system team and they need to ensure that all disciplines deliver uh, under the scope for the power-ups, for the scope like for this uh, first push. The designer is a de the designer for the artificial uh, intelligence team and he has like, uh, it's really important his job on balancing the game's difficulty because he needs to design all the enemies, how they drive, and also how they use the power-ups against each other and against the players. Okay. Um, our programmer is a programmer for a 3C team. 3C meaning character, camera, controls. And they are responsible for uh, the way the card drives and also for the way that it responds to the player's input. And last but definitely not least, we have the artist which is part of the level art team. And uh, this specific artist is going to be creating art for the track at, as well as the background. And the goal is that it feels very much like alive and dynamic. So we go and we have like the six months. We all have like our responsibilities. We are in our uh, separate teams and um, we are really good professionals. So we do like an excellent job on our individual tasks, 
and we finally have our first playable build. And it is a complete disaster because it does not meet the quality standards that we wanted it to meet. It barely holds up as a game and it's further away from being a cheapable product than expected. So let's see what went wrong for each of the four uh, colleagues that we previously looked at. So for the producer, like this said, like for we need, we, according to the forecast, we can have this scope of power-ups. Uh, the thing is that only half of them actually got made. And from the ones that got made, a lot of them don't even meet the um, quality standards. So it kind of indicates that maybe the scope was too big. For the designer, is, uh, now that he's actually seeing the cars in an actual uh, track, uh, some of the cars are start driving in the wrong direction. And whenever they pick up power-ups, they attack each other much more than they attack the player. So, well, they are not providing any kind of challenge. The programmer, well, they know that the car um, is handling exactly how it was supposed to because there's like no bugs in it, but they had never seen it in an actual uh, track. And this track has uh, uh, turns that are much sharper than anticipated. So, well, it's, they are kind of impossible to do and the car is always bumping against walls. And for the artist, well, they were, they were sharing screenshots around the studio of the track and everyone was praising it. Like, this looks amazing. This looks like something that could be like in the final game. But now that the, the cars are actually in the track, readability of the, um, of the characters and of the cards is really, really poor. Um, and it's really hard to understand what is a character and what is a prop. So, who failed? And I think that there is always the temptation to say that, well, it's a first playable build, so it's uh, supposed to, uh, to lack quality, and there's, we are supposed to fail a lot, um, and it's fine that we didn't meet what we set out to do. But I would argue that we should fail faster, and we should find quality faster in the process. And once we attain that quality, we should not let it deprecate. So again, who failed? Well, no one and everyone. Because if the producer understood uh, programming art or design better, they could anticipate that the scope was too large. And in the same way, if all the other disciplines understood production better, they could help produce better forecasts that would inform the scope in a much better way. The programmer did the mistake that they only tested uh, the car controls in, a, in a ideal scenarios and in, in tracks that they designed themselves. And, um, well, they just didn't sync with the track level designer. And uh, this programmer actually went to, to speak with this designer who told him like, that um, there was no real reason for the sharps to be, uh, for the uh, turns to be so sharp. It was more like an artistic decision and they didn't really know what were the um, car physics that the game was aiming for. The designer did something similar. They tested the, all the AI in ideal scenarios, not in the, in the actual track. And, um, and so they also could not anticipate all the, um, all the issues that could arise from uh, the final uh, build. And for the artists, it became fairly obvious that there was no continuous dialogue with the other artists that was designing the characters and the cards. And so this brought up a, a lot of readability issues, uh, which could have been mitigated or outright removed. Now, I have a confession to make. Um, I failed like this many, many times. And I have another confession to make, which is I actually saw this happening a lot, also in indie studios. And I saw this happening in VR projects and console projects and mobile and, and console, like all projects. And, and I have colleagues in other studios that report the same things. So it is a chronic issue that affects the industry in all its dimensions. Of course, many studios know this and they try to mitigate this, either by uh, hosting uh, regular play sessions, or being uh, transparent in the communication across the whole hierarchy, or by promoting initiatives to break these artificial silos, or by providing easily accessible, comprehensive documentation about each part of the project. 
But I think that the issue goes beyond studio-wide um, processes. And I think that the issue also lies in each one of us. As such, I want to propose an alternative, but more honest, title for this talk. Instead of the indie approach to AAA development, I want to call it the solo window developer mindset against over-specialization. It's less sexy, but it's more accurate. Because the big failure of the entire process was over-specialization. Everybody was too focused on completing their tasks and being the best at their job that they forgot something. That before they are a producer, a programmer, a designer, or an artist, they are game developers who develop games and not parts of games. And while they were hired for specialized roles, there was no enforcement on specialized attention. You need to be an expert on your field, but you need to at least have a basic understanding of others. Because one thing became obvious, what makes a game good, it's not the amount of puzzle pieces that compose it and how good each piece looks on their own, but the way they fit together. And if this is true, then the only way that someone can aim to make a good game is if they have an holistic vision of the game, its current state and its desired one. Now, obviously, this is a very bad scenario where teams only communicated after six months. And thankfully, in most studios, we have like more common, more um, places where communication happen. And we have directors trying to promote this shared vision. But even directors often fail on having it because games are increasingly more complex and then a director cannot, for instance, have an holistic vision of all the technical aspects of a game. It is always the best effort from anyone. So it is up to each one of us to seek an holistic vision of the project, an holistic vision of the game, and to promote a better understanding of all disciplines. And I have some tips on things that I think will help promote that better understanding. Talk to your colleagues. It's fairly obvious, but you'd be surprised at the amount of times it doesn't happen. If you maintain a constant dialogue avenue, uh, it means that there are issues that are picked up much earlier before they become real problems. Play the game as much as possible. You need to comprehend what game you are making so that you, in order to optimize what you develop for it. Share as much info as possible because what you think is common knowledge very often is not. Do not play hot potato with bugs. And if you find a bug, try to comprehend the root cause. You're going to learn something in the process and next time you encounter something similar, you will know how to handle it. And last, but definitely for me the most important, understand what others' work entails. And if you, cannot, if you don't have that opportunity at your uh, job, then try to make some small games at home. Try to have a hand in all aspects of game development. And it's, uh, you're probably going to suck in a lot of them, you're going to be good in some, but what's important is that you actually um, try. Because we are making games, not parts of them. A solo indie developer knows this, and you should too. Thank you. Question? Oh, all right. Oh, I'm in. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know if you hear me. Probably not. So I'm me gonna too. go like much closer to you. <laughs> Give me a second. All right. So, um, so my question for you. So, um, um, obviously, when we do development, there's uh, multiple multiple stage to it. Yeah. And once you um, uh, once you you said okay, make many projects try and fail, which is fine, but uh, sometimes you also want to have like proper QA. So, so how do you approach QA when you are working on a multiplayer game, for example? Yeah, um, so I believe that um, actually the, in, 
I think I'm very fortunate because I've been, most studios that I've been in incorporate QA in the entire process and also in the team. So we don't have these things that you read sometimes that like we have like QA somewhere. And um, so although we have like all these stages, I think QA should always be there. And I also think that the QA effort shouldn't only be on the, on the, on a QA tester or someone responsible for QA, but on everyone. So uh, even if you are a programmer, if you can uh, actually like produce QA tools or something like this, that will help everyone. Yeah. So um, uh, what kind of uh, QA tools will you uh, suggest for, uh, for the people to look at or uh, maybe a form factor that uh, is easier in production so that everyone that is involved has an uh, understanding of what are the things to fix or the priority? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I think is very important is that whenever you develop something, that you actually develop uh, debug tools, even if it is like uh, some way of, um, even if it is as simple as like showing a value on the screen so that you can see it change. Uh, I think that kind of thing already helps a lot. And if there's like at least like a base uh, for it, then it, it can help like everyone else because it helps the QA tester debug things. It also helps uh, designers, helps programmers, helps everyone. Fantastic. Uh, does anyone have question? All right, no question. So yep. Thank you so much. That was yeah. very informative. Thank you. Thank you.